eyes. They are said to be the windows of the soul, and they carry a lot of importance in many cultures around the world. There is something special about the eyes. You can sense an emotion just by looking into the eyes of another person. We humanize animals and project what they're feeling because of what we think their eyes tells us. That's why snakes and sharks seem much scarier than other animals. Sure, they actually kill people, but look at their eyes. Especially the eyes of a shark. It looks empty, devoid of any emotion. It's harder to look someone in the eyes when you lie. I think it's because we don't want them to see that we're lying. If we expose ourselves in that way, they can see it in our eyes. Why am I talking so much about eyes? Well, I like to try and keep things in the theme of whoever I'm covering, and today I'm covering Charles Albright, nicknamed the Texas Eyeball Killer, a nickname he earned after removing the eyes of three women in the early 90s. So let's strap in and talk about the eyeball killer. Charles Albright was a highly unusual suspect. He could speak French and Spanish fluently, he enjoyed a deep poem and read fine wine, and he could play all the classics on his piano. He was a man of culture, but it was much more beneath that. To those around him, they saw a man of culture, squeamish of violence, but the violence was engraved in his DNA. Charles didn't suffer a violent upbringing, but it was an upbringing not too unusual for serial killers to have. His father abandoned him before he was born, and so he grew up with his mother. She coddled him and promised to never ever abandon him, and her parenting was good, but at times it went a little too far. She occasionally would dress Charles Albright up in dresses and give him dolls, and she would bring him to the big iron cages to look at polio victims. The 40s certainly was different. The reason she had brought him to view these sick and suffering people was to deter him, to keep him alert so that he didn't get polio, so that he wouldn't play around too much in the yard, accidentally touching some dog feces. She also had a weird way of disciplining young Charles. She would tie him to the bed and spank him, something that surely contributed to Charles' weird sexual fantasies. She also taught young Charles from an early age to respect women and sex. She told him of his father, who had been greedy when it came to having sex. He would see her in her bra and just grab her. And while her intent was good, the impact of telling these things to her young son only made his views of sex that much more bizarre. The seeds were planted and would bloom into something highly sadistic as Charles got older. At some point in childhood, Charles' obsession with eyes begun. He would take the eyes out of the dolls he had 
and when he got into his teenage years, he began taking courses in taxidermy. He would gaze at the eyes. He wanted to collect them. He wanted to put them in a bag like the other boys would collect marbles. Charles became somewhat of a class clown. But his pranks would at times display the undertones of his simmering sadism. Andrew, a boy in Charles' class, had recently broken up with one of the hottest girls on campus. In a fit of rage, he had thrown out all pictures of her in the trash can. But a couple of days later, as Andrew entered his dorm, he noticed something odd. He had a photograph of his new girlfriend. But as he looked closer, he noticed that her eyes had been cut out and replaced with the eyes of his ex-girlfriend. Andrew looked up, and there in the ceiling was two more eyes glued. They were everywhere, in the bathroom and in the hallway. Charles had taken the photographs out of the trash can and carefully cut out the eyes of Andrew's ex-girlfriend. To him, it was a silly prank. But it's a pretty cruel thing to do and a creepy thing to do. Charles got older and lived his life as normally as one would expect, but as the early 90s rolled in, he would begin his escapade of death. It was all about their eyes. Charles Albright had never been with a prostitute before. He never cruised for them or came near them, but on December 13, 1990, he struck for the first time. Charles was pretty indiscriminate in his killings. He didn't want to kill men, but the race didn't seem to matter to him as much as it does for other killers out there. Two of his victims were white, and one of his victims was black. The common denominator, though, was their occupation. They were all prostitutes, vulnerable targets. But occupation or race was unimportant, really. He wanted their eyes. Sensitive viewers beware as I will show images of what happened on that December day in Dallas, Texas. Her name was Mary Lou Pratt, 35 years old. She made a living from prostituting, but she rarely had any pocket money. She would spend all of it on drugs, and at night she would go to her parents' house and sleep in her childhood bed. They never knew what she did for a living. She was standing on the corner that day, wearing a t-shirt and jeans, when Charles Albright picked her up. It was a tough nut to crack. Mary Lou Pratt had been killed in one location and then dumped in a lower class area. The scene reminds me of the Black Dahlia a little bit. She was laying on her back with her shirt pulled over her chest, but the oddest thing of all was her eyes. They were gone. The killer had taken her eyes out, but he had been so precise that no tissue was found. The eyelids were intact and nothing but a dark hole was left. Two dark pits staring blankly into the sky. It was clearly someone with skill and knowledge. This skill was probably picked up by Charles as he studied his taxidermy. He also read several medical books. But it alarmed investigators because things like that just didn't happen. Sure, people get stabbed in the eyes. They may even have their eyes gouged out. But this was so surgically precise, they clearly had a problem on their hands. Mary Lou had been beaten by her killer before he shot her in the head. Then he had taken his time to remove the precious eyes before dumping her in plain sight for all to see. A couple of months went by and Charles had temporarily clenched his dirty desires, his thirst. But then in February of 1991, he struck again. Her name was Susan Peterson, and she had been dumped on the same stretch of road as Mary Pratt had been just a few months earlier. This was a slight problem though, because it meant that she was found just outside the city limits, so the Dallas County Sheriff's Office had to handle the case. Luckily, there seems to have been a good correspondence going on. The medical examiner was shocked when he opened the dead body's closed eyelids the eyes were gone, expertly and surgically removed. 
This finding got the wheels spinning, and the county sheriff's office contacted the Dallas Police Department. The way Susan had died was very similar to the way Mary had died. She had been shot three times, once in the chest, once in the stomach, and once in the head. Then she had been laid out on the ground, her shirt pulled up and her pants pulled down, displayed for all to see. Charles Albright, for some reason, needed others to see what he had done. He could have dumped their bodies somewhere and they may never have been found. They were, after all, prostitutes and from what I know, in similar cases such as the Poughkeepsie Strangler, police don't really investigate those cases as much. But Charles basically forced the department to react. It was almost a challenge. A very sick, depraved and bizarre challenge. Albright wasn't like Frank Massini, a serial killer I covered in my previous video. He didn't pop out of the blue. The breadcrumbs were there. He had been caught for small time things like shoplifting perfume. But the one thing, the one big red warning sign, was what had happened just five years before his first murder. You see, Charles, just like Dennis Rader, was a church going man. And in that year of 1985, he had taken a liking to a family. He had dressed up as Santa for them on Christmas, and he had given them food and charity. But one night, he had snuck into the daughter's room and molested her. He denied doing it, of course, and the whole trial was kept quiet by the request of both Charles and the family. But he did confess to having sex with a girl under the age of 14. He wore his disguise very well, but once in a blue moon, the string that held the mask up would snap and he would reveal his true face. Warning to sensitive viewers, look away from the screen if you're squeamish and just listen as I cover Charles Albright's last murder. The last victim, Shirley Williams, a black prostitute, had a little more sadism to it. Not the murder itself, but the way she had been dumped, and where. Shirley worked at the Motel Avalon as a maid by day, and she worked the streets at night. No one saw her after her last maid shift that night. It wasn't until the morning after, March 19, 1991, that Shirley's naked corpse was found crumpled up by the sidewalk, half a block away from an elementary school. A sidewalk where tons of children walked by that morning to get to school. It must have been deliberate. He had taken her somewhere, killed her and removed her eyes under what necessarily must have been a brightly lit room, and then when it came to dumping her body, he must have chosen the location with intent. The investigators were quick on the scene and quickly investigated the nude body's eyes. Just as they expected, they were gone, cut out meticulously. They had been working this case for a while now, it was on top of their priority list. Something that happens when you cut out eyes and display dead nude bodies in public. It's safe to look at your screen again. He had been a little sloppy this time. He had been in a hurry as the examiner found the tip of a scalpel lodged in the woman's eye socket. Albright had also for the first time murdered a black woman. His first two victims were white. But the fire had been started, and it was just a matter of time before it spread and burned down the paper cloak that Charles Albright hid himself behind. Police worked the prostitutes, they gathered stories and info. At some point they got a name, Axton Schindler. They searched his address, but a new name came up. A tenant, Fred Albright. But Fred was dead, and so that only left them with a third name, Charles Albright. Two prostitutes pointed Albright out. One of them had been attacked by Albright, but she had maced him in the face. The other had been assaulted and raped by Albright. They may not have had him on the murders, for now, but they had him for attempted murder at least. The police never found the eyeballs, but they found medical books scalpel blades that matched the one found in Shirley Williams' eye socket 
and a whole heap of true crime books. They also found weapons hidden away, but none of the weapons found had been used in the murders. But Albright's downfall would ultimately be hair. He had left pubic hair and hair from his head on the body of Shirley Williams. There was also hair from the first two victims found in his trunk and hair from Shirley found in his vacuum cleaner. Police were then contacted by a woman who knew Albright. He would take her out to a location for sex and as she showed them this location, they spotted a yellow raincoat. It was identical to a raincoat Shirley Williams had worn the night she disappeared. And on that raincoat was more hair. Hair that matched Albright. For a while it was discussed by defense attorneys whether the man Charles rented his house from, Axton Chindler, was responsible. But no evidence of his involvement was ever found and no prostitute recognized him while many prostitutes recognized Charles Albright. Albright was sentenced to life in prison in December of 1991, one year after he had murdered his first victim, Mary Pratt. There he sits to this day, locked in a cage. His eyes will never get to see the beauties freedom supplies ever again.